I'm bringing my golden doodle along with me. I have some serious concerns about taking a dog on a through hike. Is your dog rattlesnake trained? No. I've seen multiple times where the dog was just miserable. It's like borderline animal abuse at some point. I know a lot of people take five to six months. I, I, I would like to complete it in 120. You're either not going to finish with the dog or you're not going to finish in 120 days. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Trail Tales. My name is Kyle O'Grady. I am a thru hiker. I am a huge hiking nerd. And every single week on this podcast, I chat with other hiking nerds about their experiences on the trail. This is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a different episode. This week, we have a prospective Appalachian Trail thru hiker on the show, and he's going to be asking me questions about his prep, things he's curious about, which I think is going to be really helpful because if you're going into a through hike, especially if it's your first time, uh, it could be a little intimidating. There's a lot of things you might wonder about. And so we're going to cover all of that in this episode. His name is Michael McAnally, and he has a YouTube channel called, which <laughs> it's called I Suck at Hiking, which is a hilarious name. I, I'm sure a lot of you can imagine that I'm kind of partial to those self self-deprecating names. Yeah, he's going to be posting videos, daily videos on his Appalachian Trail through hike this year. And I'm so excited to welcome him to the show. So Michael, how's it going, man? I'm doing fantastic. First and foremost, how's this mustache look on camera? It, it looks great. It looks great. It's fantastic. Um, looks good. All right. It's new. So I'm just trying it out. So you're going to be hiking the AT Pretty soon here. Don't say your exact start date because we don't want people, <laughs> weird people out there trying to find you. But roughly, what's your start date going to be? Late February. So late February. Decided, decided that early, early cold start. Yeah. And you're a Florida man. So that you, you should be used to that. Um, <laughs> that's sarcasm. But I am. I am brave. I'm telling you, well, I don't like the cold. So um, it is it's going to be. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, man. Well, a lot of it's going to be a challenge, but um, I don't know. Hopefully, you'll be a little more prepared after this episode. So, what is your backpacking experience? Can you and can you just kind of introduce yourself? Um, I know you're not a total total novice, but this is your first through hike, correct? Going to be my first through hike, and I mean, I still consider myself a novice because I didn't start actually backpacking back back backpacking slash, you know, overnight camping in this type of style until 2020 when, when COVID happened and, uh, my gym shut down. I wasn't able to go. I'm, I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Right. And for those of you guys that don't know what that is, um, it takes a very long time and investment in the sport to get to that level. And, you know, it was 10 years for me to get a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So, um, three years into hiking, I still very much consider myself a novice, hence the name. I suck at hiking. I mean, I make a lot of mistakes. I screw things up. And um, and so, yeah, I started in 2020. Um, I jumped on the Appalachian Trail. And uh, I jumped on the Appalachian Trail. I wanted to finish from Springer all the way to the, the, the Georgia-North Carolina border, but did not make it. So what happened then? Why, why didn't you make it? I, I don't know, Michael. That's not, a good, that's not a good start if you want to make it all the way to Maine. <laughs> I know. So I, I'm just giving you shit. By the way, I mean, I'm sure everyone saw the title. Uh, it's all, it's all in, it's all in jest. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Michael's a good so, sport too. <laughs> my son, I took my son with me, and uh, he's he's 20 years old now. But don't blame was, this uh, on your son. Is that what you're about to do? Unfortunately, I took somebody <laughs> with me, and uh, <laughs> you know how it goes when you have somebody with you. It's kind of like it's not just your hike. So, um, you know, we 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 did uh, all the way to Neil's Gap, and we got up the next morning to leave out of Neil's Gap and to, to head out the next day. And unfortunately he got this uncontrollable nosebleed right there Ooh. at the outfitter store. And so kind of, you know, pulling on the dad's heartstrings, I couldn't, I couldn't make him go out in the woods anymore. I was like, you know what, we'll go ahead and end it here and I'll come back and finish this guy myself. Yeah, that's, that's very reasonable. Um, I thought it was going to be something like, Oh, like I didn't like it or something like that. And then that was going to be a bad sign, but a, a very understandable circumstances, dude. Um, yeah, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but you know, definitely. <laughs> no, was, I, I'm, I'm glad he was okay. And you've hiked out in Colorado a little bit. Where, where else have you, uh, or what other like backpacking experience do you have? 
So my next, you know, my next big adventure, I wanted to fi- finish that section of the trail. So the next time I went out, I went out back into Neal's Gap and took my wife with me. So nice. uh, I took my wife with me to finish from North Carolina or from the Neal's Gap to the to the Georgia border. And uh, that was a successful trip. Uh, although No, no nosebleeds that time. <laughs> on, on the last day, she actually tweaked her knee a little bit. And we were very close to the to the uh, to the Georgia border, Georgia North Carolina border, and so I um, I left her at I think it was Dix Creek Gap, which is like the last like dirt road before you get to the border, and it's a three mile trek uh, up the mountain to the border, and so she stayed there, and I did my very first trail running experience and ran the three <laughs> miles up the mountain and back nice. in about an hour and a half. <laughs> so nice. Well, you got it done, dude. Um, and then Colorado, I know you, I've watched one of your videos where you were over there testing some gear. Yeah, we took a trip out to Colorado. Uh, cold weather gear is hard to test here in the Southeast, especially um, when I started prepping, you know, early this year. So I haven't had any cold weather. So we flew out to Colorado, did the Lost Creek Wilderness out there. Um, beautiful, beautiful place to, to hike. You know, uh, my first time to Colorado ever and um, definitely will not be my last, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, Colorado's the shit. Um, Okay. I think one of the most important questions before we kind of flip this around and you start asking me some questions, why are you going to through hike the AT? What's the motivation? What are you looking to get out of the experience? Yeah, why? Why why would you why would you put yourself through this? No, just kidding. But yeah, why? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm a very competitive person. And when I first heard about the Appalachian Trail, I had gone my entire adult life, you know, without hearing about these through hikes or any hearing anything about the hiking community. And when I first heard about the Appalachian Trail, it was a, a, a local couple here that is uh, friends of ours that their son had come to my gym. And they told me about how that they had done this through hike right after they got married, you know, like 20 years ago. And that piqued my interest. And so when kind of the world shut down. I was like, I'm going to go do this stretch of the trail. I absolutely fell in love. I became addicted. It was another challenge. It was something to overcome. It was something that I looked at and I was like, man, I'm going to do this thing a little bit at a time. But this last section that I went out and did, the my most current section of the trail, I went from the North Carolina border to Fontana Dam, 90 miles on my own. So finally did me a solo trip, didn't bring anybody with me. And it was on that trip that I could see those other through hikers out there. I met a lot of the community and I was like, I, I got to do this whole thing. I, I've got to <laughs> do it. And I got to do it all in one shot. I, I'm not going to do this thing a little bit at a time. So discussions with the wife, make sure I get hundred percent approval to let me go. And um, I'm just at a point in time in my life where it's, it's a possibility for me to do it. A lot of people do this in a transitional time of their life, but I, I actually, you know, have a stable business and it's somebody that can actually run it while I'm gone. So nice. I'm like, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, I, I need to just go get it done. And she was willing to let me do it. So nice, that, was, that was the big deciding factor with her. That's awesome. And good for your wife. Um, you know, you sounds like you're fairly well prepared, actually. Uh, of course, you know, you can always be more prepared, but the fact that you've already got a decent amount of not just backpacking experience, but experience on the AT itself, on the part of the trail where you're going to be starting, um, I think you're going to find that that is going to give you a, a pretty big advantage over a lot of people who have either never hiked on the AT or have never hiked or backpacked, period. And so um, I'm excited for you, dude. I think at this point, why don't we kind of flip this around? So I I just want to give you the opportunity to ask me, you know, someone who's done this, any questions about through hiking, things you're nervous about, things you don't quite understand. Again, it sounds like you probably have a pretty good understanding of it, but um, yeah, or even some questions you think that other prospective through hikers, uh, 2024 hopefuls might have. Um, just anything like that, dude. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, you, try to use this as a, uh, yeah, try to use this as an opportunity to, um, I don't know, learn some stuff to help you get even more prepared. Yeah, I'm one of those guys that I think over prepares and studies and and does all of those things. So uh, because you know because I'm a competitive person, I've been doing jujitsu competitively and fighting other people for a long time. I am a prepper, but. 
it's almost one of those experiences like you don't know until you go. You know what I mean? So I've done section hikes. I've been out for a week at a time, but I have never been out for months at a time and dealing with the things that that I know you've already walked through and the things that you've already dealt. So, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to lean in on your experience here. And I want to the first question that I want to ask you is like, what's what do you think the biggest mistake is that you made hiking the AT? Oh, man. Um, I'll break it down a little bit because I think there's a lot of really common mistakes that I didn't necessarily make. Um, and then I'll try to think of some that I did too. The first one, which based on your experience already, I don't think you're going to make this mistake, but a lot of people will. And it's low hanging fruit, but it's just so important that I'm going to say it is people just overpack. Uh, actually, it does sound like you did make that mistake at one point. <laughs> I've, but um, I, I definitely made that mistake. Do you want to know what my weight was? Yes, my I weight, do. On my, my first trip? All right, you're going to make, you're, you're going to make fun of me. <laughs> it, I was at 55 pounds. <laughs> well, you know, I, of course I want to make fun of you for that, but <laughs> we all do it, dude. My first, as I've said many times on the show, my first number of backpacking trips... You know, I was carrying way too much stuff. And this is why it's so good that you have all this experience already. And I think one of the biggest takeaways uh, for prospective through hikers and some of you that are going to be leaving shortly, you might be, I'm not trying to stress you out because the clock's kind of ticking now, but um, you know, especially if you're going to be through hiking in years like to come, not this year, like, yeah, just getting as much experience as you can, even if it's just for a night, you know, various um, at various points, like, Super, super helpful because you'll you'll make all these mistakes when the when the stakes aren't as high as like oh yeah I just quit my job to go hike for for five months. Um, but anyways, back to your original question. Yeah, that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is just having too much weight um, in their pack. In particular, another big one, which again this isn't really one that I made to be honest, but um, another really common one. Again, it's been talked about on the show, but just starting too fast. You know, people, they're so excited to be out there. So, like, I totally get it. Like, they're so excited. They've been planning this for so long. They've been thinking about it for so long. And so they finally get out there, and they're like, they just want to hit the ground running. And so they just hike too far, too fast in their first couple days, and then they get injured because of it. And so I would say go less hard than you think you're... uh, your cap is, if that makes sense, which is, I did not phrase that well, but you know, if you have a hundred percent to give, give 70% for those first couple days and also take a zero at your first or second resupply. Even if you're totally fine and you think you can hike out, I I still think it's going to be beneficial to take a zero, um, early on and just ease into it. And then you'll very quickly be able to ramp up the miles, but don't overdo it at the beginning it's very tempting, and a lot of people do that. They get hurt, and then they're off trail within two weeks. Um, let me think of a mistake that I made in particular. I thought I did pretty good, honestly. I would not have if I again didn't have a lot of it, a lot of backpacking experience before I started. But I think that I was a little bit, a little bit too focused on the end. Sometimes, maybe not even the end. More like I was, I was too focused on the goal. And that kind of took me out of the moment a little bit. And this is a fine line because I think that if I hadn't been so focused on the overall goal, then I wouldn't have made it, to be honest. Um, So, yeah, it it is it's tricky, but sometimes you have to really think about that balance between I set an objective, a, a difficult one, and I want to achieve it. And so I have to be, you know, motivated and driven in order to do that. But at the same time, Sometimes you got to just take a step back and just be present and really soak it up. And I, and I did do that quite a bit. I just think that maybe I, I wish that I had done it a little bit more. And um, yeah, I definitely made some other mistakes too, dude. Like <laughs> I, I, I did not know how to prevent chafing and I still don't, add, but I, I'm a little bit better. On the PCT, I was a little bit better about it. And um, also starting in May when you're a sweater might not have been the best idea because going back to the chafing hot in the South, that was tough, but you're used to the Florida heat and humidity. So hopefully you'll be a little better in that regard. Yeah, I think so. All right. So next question, you ready? All right. Yep. So what do you wish you knew before you started? Um, whew, 
That's a really good question, dude. <laughs> You're making me um not envious of the people I interview when I ask them these like very open ended <laughs> questions. Which it's 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 a great question. That's not a knock on your your question asking ability, but um Wow, my brain really stopped working there, didn't it? But I will tell you right now, one thing I wish I knew before I started the AT was how freaking cool Garage Grown Gear is. That's right, Garage Grown Gear is the sponsor of this episode. They are your one-stop shop for all things all <coughs> They are your one-stop shop for all things ultralight and cottage backpacking gear. They're an online store for all sorts of different gear companies. They have the big ones like Z-Packs and Hyperlight and that stuff, but they also have a lot of small companies, ones that I'm pretty sure that most of you have never even heard of. Some of you might recall that I had Lloyd Vogel, the CEO of Garage Grown Gear on the podcast. And I was really surprised to learn that when they choose companies, they're not just looking at what's gonna make them the most money. They actually choose companies simply because they think they're doing a really cool thing, even if they're not gonna be that profitable. And I think this really shows you where Garage Grown Gear is coming from. They're great people, and they're also doing a great service for us hikers, not to mention the small, often, you know, startup gear companies that they're selling. There's so many different gear companies out there. And so having one central place where you can find so many of them is just huge, in my opinion. You don't have to bookmark a hundred different gear websites. You don't have to browse all these Reddit forums and Facebook groups and all this nonsense. You just gotta go on Garage Grown Gear's website, which is garagegrowngear.com, by the way. I'll also have a link to that in the description and show notes. You just gotta go on their website and browse through what they have. I guarantee you're gonna find some really cool stuff that you've never seen before. And so thank you so much to Garage Grown Gear for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's get back to it. I wish I knew that <laughs> I was going to make it, <laughs> to be honest, because I think I would have been a little bit less stressed out at the beginning. I Because I've talked about this again in, in previous episodes, but with a late start date, you know, I was kind of up against the clock, which is something hopefully you will not have to deal with. However, my understanding is you set like a, a time goal for yourself, didn't you? <sighs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I told you, I'm a goal-oriented, challenging type of a guy. So I, I did, I mean, I, I would like to complete it in 120. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people take five to six months, but I, I just don't foresee myself um, doing that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with setting that goal. I just hope that you won't be like so rigid with it that like it's going to affect the quality of your hike you know and your your happiness while you're out there because for me you know i had a a time frame that i had to finish in as well except there was no uh i couldn't change that that was just because i started late and i had until the end of the season and then you know i guess with you you could certainly push that date back if you had to and i just hope you'll i, I mean i'm not saying you shouldn't go for that that time goal but if it looks like it's not going to work out, I just hope that you don't let that affect you and you're okay with changing it. Um, but anyways, just getting back to the original um, point of the question, I just wish, yeah, that I wish that I knew that I was going to make it when I started because I wouldn't have been as, as stressed out. And so I'm not exactly sure how that can apply to you, but um, just you got to, you just got to be aware that like, it's good to, this kind of goes back to my previous answer, honestly, it's good to be motivated and disciplined with your, your speed, your time, your pace, all these things, but also don't let it go over the top because it will have a detrimental effect on your hike and you won't enjoy it as much. So I don't know. That's not, I feel like that's not the best answer, but that's, that's, that's what right. I got. I'm not going to stick to like the, the, the 120 is like, a barometer, but I'm not going to be like so focused on just hitting that that I won't, you know, because things can happen. I understand that things can yeah, happen. Yeah, man, for sure. All right. So the big question is, are you a purist when it comes to like every step, right? Like every step. I see a lot of people blue blaze, a lot of people canoe trip, a lot of people leave and come back and skip sections and do stuff like that. But I mean, when you label yourself as a through hiker, I mean, you have to, you know, I, 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 I'm going to let you answer it. You know, yeah. what's your thoughts on being a purist on every single step, every, every white blaze passed? Yeah. Um, you're trying to get me in trouble, aren't you? No, this has been something that we've talked about and, and it's a, it's a big question. What is a through hike, right? I made a whole video on this, uh, 
some some months ago because technically i guess not even technically but i think a lot of people think that it's a through hike once it's complete but then again when you're in the middle of a through hike you call yourself a through hiker even though you haven't finished the through hike yet and so it's like it, it doesn't make any sense like how how many miles does the trail have to be in order for it to be a through hike so obviously this is all up to personal interpretation and I just want to make that clear because at the end of the day, you kind of have to just decide this for yourself. But since you asked me for myself on the AT, like I pretty, I would say I was pretty much a purist, although I don't like to call myself that because I feel like the term purist has like a, uh, people, man, my brain is not working this morning. Um, I feel like people think of that as a negative thing. Like, oh, you're just a purist. Um, and and I and there's probably people out there that are even more purist than I was. You know, like when I would get dropped off at a road crossing, I wasn't like double, you know, doubling back across the road just to make sure I <laughs> walked across the road. You know, there's some people that do that. And, and again, that's that's fine. Um, those people that I was, do that, literally? Yeah, not a lot, but they, they are out there. And, <laughs> and so I wasn't like that extreme because I, I feel like that's what people think of when they think of a purist. Or if like yeah. you come to a spot on the trail where there's a tree in the middle of the trail and there's two paths around the tree, like people will like circle around the tree to make sure they get both paths. Like I wasn't doing like <laughs> shit like that. Or if there was like a a spur trail into a shelter and then another spur trail out of the shelter that cuts out like point zero zero one miles or like, you know, 20 feet of the trail you know i wasn't too worried about that um but i was trying to hike the whole trail i wasn't trying to do the aqua blaze thing and you know i wasn't trying to take any shortcuts like i remember in virginia leaving damascus you can kind of take the virginia creeper trail and it, I don't even know if it actually is a shortcut, really. I don't even remember if it cuts out any miles, but it's just like a little bit easier because it's like a bike trail kind of. So a lot okay. of people would do that for just a few miles. And, and yeah, I wasn't trying to do that, but I'm not saying that other people can't do that. Like I, I know lots of people who have aqua blaze and said it was sick. Uh, a lot of people said the creeper trail was really cool. So, you know, you, you do whatever you want. But for me, I wanted to hike the whole trail and It kind of came, I had that same mentality on the PCT and that really kind of bit me in the ass. So, you know, there's pros and cons for sure. Although on the AT specifically, I do think it's pretty realistic to, to hike the whole trail. The PCT, not so much anymore, Um, but it is what it is. The PCT is a hard one, especially with the the wildfires are just unpredictable every single year. So you got that right. So uh, next question. Are you ready? I, I'm not a big fan of that term that, that everybody uses. And, you know, it's been around for years. I don't know how many years that it's been around, but, you know, everybody's referred to as hiker trash. You know what I mean? So I, I'm not a big proponent of calling myself trash. So what's your <laughs> thoughts on that? And, and are you okay with that being called hiker trash? Look at this guy. He hasn't even through hiked yet. He's already saying that people should cut out Super common language. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't have a problem with it at all. It's Darwin. Darwin on the trails talked about this before because he's gotten comments in the past. He's like, why are you calling hiker trash? Like that's like that's so offensive. And he says it's a term of endearment, which is kind of how I see it, too. I don't have any problem with it. Um, and I think that I think that you might come around to it. Okay. Maybe. When, when you find yourself, you know, a thousand miles in and desperate to get into town and you haven't showered in multiple days and uh, maybe the last time you dug a cat hole, things got a little messy and you didn't get totally cleaned up as well as you would like and you get a hitch into town and you're sitting on some bags of trash in the back of a pickup truck, maybe at that point you might be like, you know what? I'm kind of okay with all of this. It's kind of awesome and it's still kind of trashy. And so that's hiker trash. And so I don't know, dude. And and maybe you won't come around to it, but for me, I like the term it's endearing. It's almost like a rite of passage, you know, like a, you wear it like a badge of honor. um, If I could throw around some more buzzwords. So I don't know. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a lot of people embrace it. I just, you know, it's one of those terms to me that's just, I don't know, it's kind of always, you, know, you, you see a lot of people catch, uh, you know, feelings about different trail terms. I mean, like trail magic, you know what I mean? Things like that, you know, or you know, tramley. People, some people call, <laughs> yeah, tramley, uh, you know, some people just like to call it free stuff, you know, or, <laughs> or other words, but that's, that's, you know, that's, that's just, you know, here and there. But the hiker trash one was the one that kind of stuck with me and I, I wanted to ask you about. But yeah. speaking of that, and you brought this up, so that leads right into that next question. What is the longest stretch you went without a shower on the AT? Oh, good question. Um, not that long, I feel like, compared to some people. Like, you'll you'll meet people out there that, like, kind of going back to the hiker trash thing, like you said there, it's like, they'll brag about how long they've gone without a shower and they'll be like, oh, I went like two weeks or something like that. I never did anything like that. To be honest, I can't even remember exactly how long I went because it, it probably wasn't anything significant. It probably wasn't more than like, I guess at the very end, maybe from Monson to the, to the end of the trail at Katahdin, I probably went like six days, maybe, maybe, yeah, probably six days. Um, and maybe there was another stretch in there somewhere. And on the PCT, it was similar, but probably not more than six days, which is not that impressive compared to some people who will like go out of their, not, not that many people to be fair, but some people will like go out of their way not to shower just to brag about it, which is, which is pretty funny. I don't know if I'd recommend that, uh, but cause that would, that would take a lot of discipline, but, um, I digress. My answer isn't super impressive there. I, I, yeah. I thought you had at least hit double digits, but so. no, dude, I don't think I have, man. I really don't think I have. Are you are you worried about not showering, or is that just no. <laughs> for fun? <laughs> I, I'm also one to jump in the in the, the the waterfall or whatever is and claim myself. So yeah. I'm not afraid to do that in a second. Good, good, good. So the next question I have for you is uh, it's about the privy situation out there, right? You have a lot of people that like literally they're like privy hoppers. You know what I mean? So they'll they'll they will will hold on to it for you know, hours, miles, and sometimes even a day to get to a privy versus digging a cat hole. I mean, were you a privy hopper or were you, I mean, were, were you, were you okay with this, you know, taking a dump anywhere? No, dude. Um, before the AT dude, I hated privies. I would avoid them. And yeah, dude. And so like on my long trail through hike, for instance, I probably used one at some point, but for the most part I was digging cat holes every other backpacking trip before the AT, I was digging cat holes. And the reason I didn't like the privies is because number one, they're disgusting. Number two, I liked more privacy to be honest. And there's nothing people, you know, a lot of people that don't backpack and through hike, one of the biggest, like scary things to them is the idea of shitting outside. But it's like, I kind of like it. Um, I like just going off trail and digging a cat hole. It's a little inconvenient and you get some flies buzzing you sometimes, but you know, it, it's so private. So I like that. Um, and so the, the thought of using privies was gross to me, but I will say the further along I got on my AT through hike, the more I started using privies because I just got like, I got lazy and they're just convenient a lot of the time, you know? It's especially if you really got to go and there's a privy right there, you don't have to worry about finding a spot that's you're not going to get spotted. You don't have to hike up a steep embankment to get far enough away. You don't have to dig and try to dig in one spot and oh, the ground's too hard. So go find another spot and dig there. They're just so much more convenient. And so I did start to use them the further along I got, but I don't know. In an ideal situation, I think I still prefer to dig a cat hole. I, I'll, I'll say on the PCT, there's not really, you know, there's no shelters. And so yeah, every now and again, you'll get like a forest service, you know, pit toilet at like a campground or a trailhead or something. So they're not non-existent out there. But um, I didn't really miss them that much on the PCT, to be honest. How, what, what are you, how do you feel about using privies? I'm sure you've used uh, a number of them at this point. Yeah, I mean, I've done the privy thing, and but you know, I remember my first experience, you know, doing the cat hole, you know, doing the whole cat hole deal itself. Um, I, I was somewhere; it was in that first section of, of of the AT trail that I was doing the very first time that I ever done this. Climbed the AT up the, trail? Did you just say the AT trail? The AT, the AT. <laughs> I love it. I love it when people say that. The Appalachian Trail Trail. <laughs> the Appalachian Trail Trail. The ATT. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, man. 
That's all right. You're 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 supposed to be giving me a hard time. So yeah, but, that's true. Uh, but anyway, so we so I I I remember this section I was in perfectly because I climbed up this hill and and I went to go dig you know the cat hole and like looked over to my right and there literally is like this pile of bear poop sitting right there and I'm like whoa he didn't dig a hole <laughs> <laughs> why am I digging a hole yeah no nah, you got to do it you got to do it um when you start the AT I'm, I'm really speaking to people that might be looking to start over the next few months here um when you start at Amicalola Falls State Park because the AT is getting so popular and through hiking is getting so popular and a lot of the people that are starting have never through hiked or backpacked before they actually have like little classes now which I don't know if they had that when I did it or if they did I didn't go to it but um they have little classes where they'll teach you like the exact protocol for like you know going to the bathroom and, and other things too like uh, food storage and so i don't know if you're experienced and you know what you're doing then you know i guess you probably don't need it but if you're if you've never backpacked or through hiked before or you just want a refresher yeah definitely when you start at amicalo falls make sure that you go to those classes I, i'm pretty sure they like really try to get you to do it even if you have through hiked like i know taylor new hampshire Literally, she had already hiked the entire AT, but when she started the second time, they still made her do the class. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know how long it takes. Like I said, I didn't do it, but um, yeah, something to keep in mind because it's important that you I, I think dispose. it's a requirement now to get your tag. Oh, that would make sense. Yeah, that would make sense. So, For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I stopped by the office when I was there last and, and kind of told them, hey, I'm coming next year. And they were like, yeah, you're going to stop in and get the tag. But they got the new visitor center open, too. So that's going to be really cool. Oh, there's a share. new visitor center. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Man, I, I got to get back there, dude. I, I'll probably <laughs> get so nostalgic. <laughs> yeah. So they have, you know, they had the old little trailers sitting off to the side of the road. Now they have a big giant building that they had been working on for years. And it's going to be open for the very first. It's, it's open now. I mean, it just cool. opened recently. Damn. So. I might go back up there. I'm thinking about doing a section hike this summer, maybe. I don't know. I probably shouldn't give away too many details. I don't want you creepy fuckers to come find me. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So last year I was given a, or not not, not last year, but this this last big hike that I did on the AT, um, the, that 90-mile section, I had a through hiker give me a trail name. Now, I mean, I don't know the etiquette, you know, uh, you know, Obviously, we used it while I was out there the entire time I was out there for that 90 miles. But next year when I start, am I allowed to keep the trail name or do I need to hit reset since I'm a a a, a perspective through hiker, not a through hiker, but because I'm a perspective through hiker, do I have to like earn my trail name? Is it, is it something that you feel like I, I need to earn during the through hike or can I keep a section hike trail name? Is that legitimate or not? I'm really glad you brought this up because I'm sure this is something that other people are wondering about. So... If you, you, you've you been given your trail name, and so if you take another trail name, the next time you cross a road, the trail police will be there waiting to take you off trail in handcuffs, which might sound exciting because you think, oh, maybe I'll be able to take a shower and get some food, but in hiker jail, you do not shower, and they do not feed you. Well, actually, that's not true. They do feed you, but they feed you the same food you were eating on trail, so there's really no advantage. You don't want to be in hiker jail. Um, that's obviously not true. But uh, you can do whatever the fuck you want. If you want to stick with your trail name, that's totally fine. If you want to take a new one, that's totally fine. I think that... Pro I'm just guessing here, but probably more people would take a new one. But you don't have to. I mean, I got my trail name well before my AT through hike, and I just stuck with it from the start. And so okay. uh, you can do whatever you want, man. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter... But uh, just, I, I would recommend personally, if your trail name has a really good story behind it now, one that you enjoy telling, then stick with it. If you don't enjoy telling that story, then maybe get a new one because you are going to have to explain that story over and over and over and fucking over. And I really wish someone had told me that before I took my trail name because I fucking hate it. And no, I don't even hate it. I hate, I hate the story behind it and I'm sick of telling it. And so I wish I had waited until I got like a really cool story that I would have been super proud of. So just maybe, uh, maybe keep that in mind with all the stuff I've watched of you. I don't think I've ever heard what your trail name is. Don't, 
Don't make me tell the story. It's it's Narnar. I, you got to tell the story. I'm not telling the story. What, what is the what is the trail name? It's it's Narnar, N A R N A R. Okay. I haven't told it in a while. Yeah, people people ask me that quite a bit. They're like, "I know like your Kyle hates hiking, but like, do you have a trail name?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but I don't really talk about it too much. Not that it's a secret, but it's just like I don't know. I use it on trail still, but I don't okay. know. I I'm, I'm so sick of the story. I'm not telling you the story. Okay. It's not no, going to happen. Right. I'll look it up. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'm sure it's out there. It's not. No, it's not worth looking up. That's why I don't want to tell it. It's because it sucks. <laughs> and and this is the thing. It's kind of a running joke too. Honestly, is like you'll you'll know what I mean eventually. Like, or maybe not if your story is actually a good story. But I know for myself and for Flossie too, who you might have seen in some of the videos, who I met on yeah. the AT. Like, we just got so sick of telling our trail name stories after a while that it it, it was like kind of comical. Like somebody would ask one of us what our story was and then the other person would kind of like start laughing in the background because like they know that the, that they're just like oh, fuck I don't want to tell this story so yeah I mean, you could come <laughs> up with like some like exuberant reason why I could just so. I could just make some shit up yeah that's what I should have done <laughs> <laughs> so um so the, the other uh question that I had like if you couldn't ever go back to the AT again so if you're not allowed to ever visit the AT again so you're not allowed to step foot anywhere but there's one one place that you're allowed to go so that would be like the one place that you're only allowed to go what would be your absolute favorite part I mean what is what is that that one spot that you're just like this was my absolute 100% favorite spot that's really that's a really good question um my I, I probably somewhere up on the presidential ridge in New Hampshire but it feels a little bit weird to me to say that because I've been to that area quite a bit outside of my through hike and I had been to it before my through hike. I've been to it a lot after. So like when I think of that area, even though it is part of the AT, I don't really think of it as like just being part of the AT. It, it really just feels like a really sick area that I've hiked in a lot and kind of feels like home. Um, and so that's where my mind goes, but for areas that I hadn't been to before my through hike and haven't been to since, probably somewhere in the Rowan Highlands, uh, or sorry, is that Jesus Christ, uh, dude? My, <laughs> I'm not on my A game today. Um, yeah, the Rowan Highlands. Yeah, yeah, probably Pony somewhere. Highlands. No, that's the Grayson Highlands. The the oh, Row the Rowan Highlands. Yeah, um, which is a little bit south of there. It's like North Carolina. Tennessee border area it was really sick. I, I want to get back there. Dude. I haven't been back there since the AT, like I said. And so, yeah, I need to get back there. That that spot, that spot, and the White Mountains were my two favorite spots on the AT. All right. So now, since we're talking about areas, I have a question, and you know this this one's always intrigued me because you see people talk about it, you see all the videos that have been done about it. But when you went to you went to the Yellow Deli, did you not? Yeah, I did. All right. So when you went to, I mean, I think, I think you just have to experience it, but were you recruited? I mean, did it, you know, or would you, or were you like one of those guys that were like, nah, we're, we're yeah. good. We don't. <laughs> Great question. So let me just give a little bit of context for those that aren't, they don't know what the yellow deli is. So okay. basically long story short in Rutland, Vermont, there is this place called the yellow deli. It is a deli. It's also a hostel for hikers and it's free. They don't charge you which they're not really doing it out of the kindness of their own heart, although it is very kind to them, but it's it's run by this religious group called 12 Tribes. Some people would even go as far as calling them a cult, which is probably how you're going to hear them referred to when you're on trail. Um, most people call them a cult. And so the reason that Michael is asking me if I was recruited is because my understanding is that the reason that they let you stay for free is because, yeah, they're trying to recruit people. And some would even go further and say that they're kind of preying on hikers and targeting hikers. And to answer your question, uh, no, I was not recruited. I was very, I feel like, kind of aware of the situation when I stayed there. And so, like, I was not going to engage in anything other than just simple pleasantries with any of the workers there, because basically what they do is they try to get you to come off trail out of town and go work on their farm. And I guess eventually they try to, you know, get you to join or whatever. And it, it's like, I don't know. I, I say they're a religious group 
it's really unique. They're like very like hippie. Like you get hippie vibes when you walk into their deli, but also they're like very conservative in some other aspects, like the way that they dress and some of the rules around like family structure and women and children and all this stuff. It's really weird. I'm not going to get into that. They're quite controversial. I'll just say you can do your own research, but um, yeah, I stayed there. I was fine. No, I never felt pressured. I never felt uncomfortable. But like I said, I went into it knowing that this was a possibility and that I'm going to really try not to like engage in like a lot of conversation with these people. Cause I have a feeling if I had gone in and was like asking them a bunch of questions about like, you know, their religion and all these things, I feel like they might've kind of sensed an opportunity there and maybe would have, you know, probably not been super direct, but would have, you know, tried to get me to come to the farm or something like that. So I would recommend you stay there to be honest. I thought it was a unique experience. Just know what you're getting into and you'll be fine. If you're a woman, I can't speak from experience, obviously, but I've heard from, you know, various people. So just anecdotal, but like I've heard that it can be a little bit sketchier. And so, um, definitely, yeah, just do some more research, uh, before you, before you stay there, but they've got a very mixed reputation on trail. I'll say that. All right. Well, the, uh, the other question I had for you, cause I plan on hiking with my dog. Um, so I'm bringing my golden doodle along with me and he's, he's done a little bit of hiking with me. I know you see this big guy and you're like, Oh, he's got a golden doodle, but, (laughs) but, um, uh, the dog's very, very much taken to me and I've taken him out on a few trips and he absolutely loves it. So, uh, I'm excited to do that, but I didn't, I didn't plan on doing a whole tramley thing. I know tramleys are the big thing out there on the trail. Uh, but I don't think I want to fall into anybody else's like timelines and, you know, or, you know, when they need to go to town, when I need to go to that kind of type of thing. So, you know, what, what, what what do you think, what's your opinion on needing community out there? And do you feel like, do I need to be plugged in, you know, or, or or have that type of support group? Cause you, did you do the majority of the trail with Flossie? Flossie and I met about halfway through, but I hiked the majority of the trail with mullet Mike, who I met on day one. And we hiked all the way up until Southern Maine when he got off trail Um, and and there was a couple times where we'd split for a few days. Like he would, he took a zero once to like stay with his girlfriend and then I just kept going. And then a few days later I took a zero and then, so we ended up sinking back up. But, um, for the most, we were, you know, after a few days of hiking together at the start, we were basically just like, yeah, we kind of want to roll together. But, um, you know, I, I understand like not wanting to be tied down to anyone else's schedule, but that's actually a really good example. A lot of the time when you form, I'm not going to use the word trailing. When you form groups, <laughs> even trail family is cringy, but it's not quite as cringy as tramley, but it's, I it's digress. Pretty cringy. Yeah. It's all pretty cringy, but this entire thing is cringy. Anyways. Um, <laughs> you know, when you form groups of people like that, a lot of the time, the reason that you actually form a group with somebody is because it kind of just happens naturally because you are kind of traveling at the same pace. And so, um, there definitely is times where you might want to hike with someone, but they're just, you're, your schedules and your pace don't match up. But a lot of the time they actually do match up like more often than you think. And that's actually why you start hiking with particular people. Um, and so I wouldn't just write it off completely. And I, I wouldn't be concerned that you have to either go at your own pace or sacrifice that in order to hike with other people. I think there's more crossover there um, than, than you might realize. That's a great question. But the dog thing, we have to talk about the dog thing. Okay. okay. Um, what or, or how much backpacking experience does your dog have? How many nights has the dog done? How many miles a day has the dog done? I have some serious concerns about taking a dog on a through hike. Um, he has been on every trip with me other than the Colorado trip. So currently he's probably got about a hundred miles on trail. And I mean, he, he can lap me. I mean, on trail as far as, you know, cause he does, basically double the miles that I do in a day because he's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in front of me. So um, I've taken him out on several trips, uh, nothing longer than a week, although he will be doing a week with me after Christmas on the Foothills Trail. And um, we'll, we'll may- maybe four or five days. But but yeah, so what's your concerns? What, you know, hit me with it. I know I, I saw that look in your face when I said dog. So Yeah, um, 
first of all, to be clear, I'm not against dogs hiking or backpacking. Uh, that's not my concern. Uh, my concern is taking a dog on a, you know, what's for you potentially going to be a four month trip. I mean, that's a lot of time, dude. That's just a, that, I don't know. It's like you, the dog can't clearly express to you how they're feeling. And I guess you can, you know, you can kind of tell, you can read their demeanor and stuff. And I don't know. I just feel like in my personal experience through hiking, especially on the AT, on the PCT, I barely saw any dogs, but on the AT, I saw quite a few at the beginning. Not so many uh, later on in the trail, uh, which should tell you a lot. But a lot of the time, dude, these dogs just looked miserable, man. Like, your dog might like it for a few days, but it's just such a commitment. You're out there for so long. And, and I know it has been done, also, to be clear, but the vast majority of the time you're either going to end up getting rid of the dog, not getting, that sounds terrible. <laughs> you're not going to be putting the <laughs> dog down. Do that. You're going to be sending the dog <laughs> off trail or you're going to be getting off trail with the dog. Um, just to be, just to be frank. Um, there's also the logistic, the logistical concern, which I'm sure you've thought about. You can't have a dog in the Smokies. Yeah. Um, and you also can't in Baxter state park, I believe at the very end of the trail. And so that's a whole nother thing. You, you're either going to have to skip those sections or you're going to have to find someone to watch the dog. Also, much like when you're hiking with uh, your your kid and your kid has a nosebleed and now that's affecting your hike, it's going to be the same thing with the dog. If the dog gets injured, probably even more so actually because the dog can't you know, speak for themselves or act for themselves. And so if the dog's injured... You got to deal with that. And that's one more thing to deal with while you're already in a very um, uh, tricky, not tricky, uh, a difficult thing, which is a through hike. And so I don't know, dude. And also I'll say, if you want to finish in 120 days, I, I'm just going to say this now and maybe I'll be wrong and I could be. And if I am, then the more power to you and we'll do another episode and you can you can let me have it. Um, but my prediction is that if you bring the dog along, you're either not going to finish with the dog or you're not going to finish in 120 days. Those are my predictions. I think you're probably going to have to, at the very least, uh, give up one of those two things. But I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I, I do want to complete it with him, but I do, I am a realist. So I do have an exit plan for the dog if, if absolutely necessary, because I do know that a through hike is not an easy thing for anybody to do, let alone, like you said, when you put your limitations are going to be based on what the other person and, or in this case, an animal is. So I, 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 I do have an exit plan for him in case that I do run into that situation. So I am aware of it and, and I will keep it in mind and put him first. If yes, it, please if do. If it comes to that, it comes, it comes to that point by all means. Please do because I don't know. I've just seen, you know, and I'm not saying that you're going to do this, but like I've seen multiple times on trail, um, just on my AT through hike alone where the dog was just miserable and their owner was just dragging them through this. And it's like, borderline animal abuse at some point, you know, and, and just don't let it get that far is all I'm saying. Like if, if the dog's not having fun, if the dog gets hurt, just please send the dog home and don't put them through that just for some arbitrary goal that they don't even realize that they're accomplishing, <laughs> please. And also there comes a whole nother responsibility. I know you've hiked with the dog already quite a bit, so hopefully you're already good with this stuff. But like I've had times where I'm sitting around camp at a shared campsite, a shelter, and someone's dog is just running around off leash and they're like sticking their nose in my food. And that's obnoxious. Like, don't, don't be that guy. Like have your dog on, on a leash at camp. Um, even while you're hiking, honestly, you should probably have a dog on leash because there's a lot of people out there that there's a lot of people that love dogs and they're happy to have a cute dog run up to them but there's also people out there that are not super cool with dogs and if a dog runs up to them and is jumping on them or whatever uh they might not like that and even if the dog doesn't jump on them just seeing a dog off leash sometimes um maybe not your dog but if it's like a you know a more aggressive looking dog then um you know that can be I used to be like that, honestly. I've come around to dogs a little bit, but 
on my through hike, like, dude, I had a couple times people's dogs like running up to me off leash. I did not care for that, even though nothing happened. And so just be mindful of that. I hope, I hope you're going to be mindful of that as well. Uh, just the courtesy around it. I will say I did trail train him to come to me when I click the leash. So I do like to let him off the leash when there's nobody on the trail with me and there I can, you know, but if I see anybody coming in the, you know, I click and he comes back, put him on the leash, walk by the people before I take him back off leash. Okay. And so I have fully trained him for that and I'm fully aware of the people that do not like animals. So, um, and, and, you know, I do want to be courteous to the, those people around me. So. Yeah, I hope you will. Um, I hope you will for <clears throat> sure because, yeah, there's also probably spots where you're required to have the dog on leash anyways. I'm not exactly familiar with this, but definitely look it up. There might be some jurisdictions you're hiking through where you're legally required to have a dog on leash, especially in bear country too, which, you know, a lot, all of the AT is bear country, but there's certain spots where the concentration of bears is higher and you're going to be, I, you're 100% guaranteed you're going to see multiple bears on your through hike. Uh, that's just how it is. And so be just be mind. That's another thing to be mindful of. Um, I, I, I don't know about most people, but I'm excited to see bears on trail. I haven't seen one yet. All the time I've spent in the woods in the last year and I haven't seen one yet. And I'm, I'm like, are they dodging me? Are they hiding from me? My wife's afraid I'm going to fight one. So, you know, um, you know, but yeah, that's just, I haven't seen one yet. I'm excited to actually see one. On, you will. On trail. You will. So, um, also, you're going to see rattlesnakes. Is your dog rattlesnake trained? No. That would be something to look. Yeah. Yeah. I would look into that for sure. Again, and I know I'm no dog expert, but I know they have like classes. I mean, you might even know uh, more about this than I do, but uh, they have like classes where you can teach your dog to like stay the fuck away from rattlesnakes basically, because just like bears, 100% guaranteed you will see multiple rattlesnakes over the course of your hike. And I would really hate for your dog to run up to one and, and get bit because it didn't know. Um, and they can kind of blend in. They're not easy to see sometimes. And I don't know how your particular dog reacts. So maybe, you know, maybe it w- it's not a concern for your dog, but for some dogs, certainly they're going to run right up to that thing and try to get in its face or whatever. And we don't want that to happen. So the other like individual question that I have for me, for you is I, I plan on, on doing the, the daily, you know, daily vlog and uh, plan on editing and posting and doing all of that on trail. And uh, you didn't get to do that for your AT through hike. And what's your opinion on that? And, you know, do you wish that you would have been able to do that? Or do you wish that that was something that you included in your through hike? Oh man, hiking with a dog and daily vlogging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I'd filmed my hike. Certainly. I don't wish that I did daily vlogs though. But that's just me. There's obviously there's lots of people that do it like Taylor, New Hampshire, for instance, IB tat, all these people, they do it and they're successful with it. So I I don't want to discourage you from doing it because just because I don't want to do it Um, on the PCT where I did film, I didn't daily vlog. I did weekly videos and I had someone else editing for me and that made it so that it was a very manageable workload. But even that, it is still extra work you're doing. And it might be fun for the first couple days or week, but there is going to come a point where you're just like, I don't feel like filming this or I don't feel like editing, probably more likely. Because I don't know how people do the editing on trail. That blows my mind. Um, no desire to do that personally. It's just too much work. Through hike is already hard enough as it is. But people do it. So, I mean, you might as well go for it. Um you're obvi- you're great on camera. Your channel's great. And so you definitely should go for it. But <laughs> all I'm saying is it would be a lot easier for you if you could have someone else edit for you and the qual- the content would be a lot better too. But um, I understand that's not feasible for, for everybody. And so something to keep in mind for sure. My thoughts behind doing it was this is something that my kids will be able to see forever. You know, my mm-hmm. kids, grandkids, and, you know, it'll be on the internet, you know, forever for them. And then also the second thing is like when you're in the moment and when you're feeling certain things and you're doing the daily, you know, vlog, it's, it's, a, it's a whole lot different than if you, you know, try to do like an after, you know what I mean? So when you're, when you're experiencing something for the first time or you're walking through something for the first time, you know, really putting those things out there, I think 
I think I'm going to appreciate being able to go back and, and, and look at it myself. Oh, definitely. So that's the reason yeah. I was asking you, do you wish that you would, you know, would have had that from yeah. when you were out there? Oh, I do. And, and I'm not trying to discourage you from filming at all. I think it's awesome. Um, I think the editing is where you're going to run into the most trouble, to be honest. I think, I think it's just going to be a lot of, and again, I don't know your process or exactly how long it's going to take you to edit each video, but at the end of the day, you're going to be tired. It's, it's hard and it's going to require a lot of discipline to edit every single day out there. And you, there's going to be times where you get behind and then you're in town finally and you want to take a zero and you just want to relax. You don't want to do anything else. You just want to lay in bed and watch TV or go to a bar and shoot the shit with people. But you're going to have to be editing and you're it's going to require a lot of discipline and some sacrifice. And so you just need to be aware of that. Um, the filming, I don't think that's going to be too difficult. It's the editing, I think, where it's going to be maybe not so fun. But people do it. Like I said a million times now, people do it. They do it great. So, you know, I'm not saying you you can't. I mean, every single year, people, multiple people do it. So yeah. go for it, dude. And, and yes, you absolutely will be it's stoked to look back on those videos. And I think it's really cool that you're thinking about your kids too. And the fact that they'll get to look back on it. So, you know, I think, um, it's, I think it's very ambitious, but I think it's better than not doing any filming at all. So, uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to see what you make and I'll be watching for sure. Fantastic. So what do you think the last question? Well, no, you know, I got, I got a couple more. I got a couple more. If you don't yeah, mind, man, go we for got it. Time? We got oh, time? oh, we got all time, right, so, man. We got time. All right. So what do you think the biggest challenge of through hiking is? And I got a, a few options for you. And then, you know, if you got something else, that's fine. So, I mean, do you think it's logistics? Do you think it's mental? Do you think it's physical? Um, I mean, time or you know, do you think it's, is like, I mean, uh, the physical part, like eating enough. I mean, th those are some of the, some of the big challenges I think I'm going to have to, to walk through. So what, what was your experience? What do you think was the biggest challenge? What do you think? What do you think I'm going to say? I think for most people, it's mental. Yep. You nailed it. You nailed it. And I'm glad you did because understanding that it's going to be very tough mentally is going to give you a huge advantage over a lot of other people because a lot of people go into it. They've seen the YouTube videos. They've seen the Instagram posts. They've seen, you know, all this stuff that highlights the, uh, the, the positive, the fun, the, the positive nature, the fun stuff. Um, and they don't realize that it's actually not just a pleasant walk every single day. And there's actually a lot of hardship on a through hike. And so understanding that it's going to be mentally tough is very important. So I'm glad that you understand that out of all the things you listed, that's definitely the hardest one. Logistics are not hard on the AT, even on other trails that are harder. The logistical aspect is still not as hard as the mental aspect. The physical aspect is definitely difficult. And I don't want to downplay that because people leave trail all the time because they're injured or their body can't handle it. But um, at the end of the day, I do think the mental challenge is going to be the hardest one. And so it's good that you're thinking about that, dude. And I hope you spend a lot more time over the next, you know, you know, couple months leading up to your hike, really thinking about that and really thinking about how you're going to push yourself through the difficult times and um, yeah, it's, I spent a lot of time thinking about that before my through hike and I think it paid off significantly. So you're, you're definitely, uh, you're definitely on the right track there. I mean, I, I had, I had a day where, you know, even just during my 90 mile section hike where I was just like, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? I could just go home right now. And, uh, I didn't obviously, but you know, I, I've had those thoughts, you know what I mean? The day I got, it was just a, you know, a tough uphill or, after, you know, right after not having water or something like that. And so I've been through those things. So I, I you know, I, I'm going to try to prepare myself mentally, but i I'm leaving a lot behind, you know what I mean? Uh, wife, kids, business all those type of things and going to be worried about those things on, on a regular basis too. But, uh, I think, I, I think I'll be able to, to fight through. Yeah, man. Well, we'll see. No, I think you will too. <laughs> I think you will too, man. And it's good that you're thinking about all that stuff. Um, all right, now let's get into some of the, uh, some of the, the, like the hard hitting questions. Like, you know, what do you get sick of eating? 
What, what, I mean, you know, I, I'm actually playing with my menu right now. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying some food that I normally would not eat because I know I'm going to have to when I'm out there. And so, you know, what, what was your, like that, that item that you just got totally like, I'm done, done with this. I never want to eat it again. I mean, for one, for, for me, like I ate, I, I entered a hot dog eating contest once I ate seven hot dogs <laughs> in like three minutes and I didn't touch a hot dog for five years. Like literally. <laughs> um, Pop tarts, I got really sick of protein bars. I got really sick of, although I kind of just continued to force them down because I never really liked them that much to begin with. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, pop tarts are the biggest one that comes to mind. I didn't really get sick of Northsides and mac and cheese on the AT. Maybe Northsides a little bit, but on the PCT, I got super sick of both of those things. And I, even to this day, yeah, thinking about future hikes, I the thought of eating more <laughs> Northsides and mac and cheese disgusts me. Um, those are the main ones. Peanut butter a little bit. I, I ate peanut butter early on, on the trail, on the AT, and then I quickly got rid of it and switched to Nutella, which I never really got sick of, even though I ate it a lot. Okay. Those are the main ones for me. Uh, maybe like beef sticks and shit like that too. I got kind of sick of, but, um, if I had to give you a piece of advice, look what other people are eating and try to get ideas from other hikers because, and this isn't really a revelation because uh, you, you're going to find that this happens naturally. You know, everybody's looking at what other people are eating and, and taking ideas and stuff. So definitely be open to that because that's how you're going to get a lot of different ideas for uh, food on trail. And, and yeah, you're going to get sick of things. It's just the reality. Sometimes you got to just push through it, unfortunately. But um, also just variety is another big thing to keep in mind. Even if it's just variety in, the type of chips you're buying, you know, or the flavor of candy or whatever, just any sort of variety is going to be good. And, uh, and th that'll help a little bit, but <laughs> also just accepting that you are going to get sick of some things sometime and eating enough food can be tricky as well. Yeah. So with the, uh, you know, I was just looking at the backpacker meals and, you know, dreading cause I'm, I'm not a big fan of like your mountain house meals and stuff like that. However, there are some good backpacker meals, but the expense of backpacker meals for that long, that many days in a row, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. They're expensive as shit. On the AT, I never, I never bought them. Okay. On the PCT, yeah. I started to just because like I said, I was getting sick of all the other things that I was eating. And so I would say maybe don't buy them at first, but then eventually if you do find yourself getting sick of your dinners and stuff. I do think they would be worth buying at that point because it's so important to keep yourself fueled out there. You're already investing so much into this hike. You know, your food is so important, you know, it's like your food and your shoes are probably the two most important things in terms of like spending money. And so eventually when you really feel like you need them, I wouldn't hold back just because of the price, but, um, that's just me. Okay. All right. Um, so, it's 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 widely known that you're not a through hiker until you've pooped yourself on trail. <laughs> so did you poop yourself on the, on the AT? And and what do you think leads to that? Why is that a normal thing? Yeah, um, I don't. I think it's just because you're eating crappy food and you're exercising every single day, and you're just things get jostled around in there. People get norovirus a lot too, especially on the AT. It's just a combination of all those things. I kind of, I didn't really do it, but I came really close a bunch of times and I did get caught wiping my ass one time, but that's a little different. <laughs> Thank God this was before I had a YouTube channel and anybody knew who I was because nowadays if that happened, oh man, that'd be embarrassing. But I, I didn't really... I didn't really do it. I, I did one time when I was running when I was in high school, but that's that was not on trail. <laughs> so I heard about all of the challenges on the trail, and I like challenging myself physically, but um, you know, I, there's like a four-state challenge. I know there is a half-gallon challenge, uh, a five-pounds of Snickers challenge, and I even <laughs> heard about <laughs> there's a fire, talent, or fire tower challenge, the fast food challenge, the Connecticut challenge, and then the Mount Musilaki dress challenge challenge i've never heard of that one I'm not <laughs> so i lie. guess that's where you just hike up to mount musilaki in a dress 
maybe some of these could be new too because again i hiked in 2018 so okay it's been a while but i've never heard of that one before <laughs> so my, my the other is, ones did you, the other ones did I've you complete of. any of them the only one that i did was the half gallon challenge to be honest i didn't do yeah i didn't do any of them besides that the half gallon challenge i feel like is a must do the rest of them I don't know. People like the challenges. It kind of sounds like you might be intrigued with those given you're asking about them. Well, I also heard like the seven second challenge where you're supposed to like hop on one of the ponies, but I don't think that's legal. Oh God. So I don't <laughs> know if you should do that one or not. Yeah, probably don't do that. <laughs> Definitely don't uh, do that. Uh, and then I, I also read about one now and you know, I'm no drinker, but uh, 24 by 24 by 24 challenge. Have you heard of that one? I, I, yeah. Is that where you hike? 24 miles in 24 hours and drink 24 beers in the process. Yeah. So you can either drink all the beers at once, which I don't know how anybody would still be standing to be able to hike 24 miles or you drink the beers over the 24 miles in the 24 hours. But so yeah, yeah I've just heard about all these challenges. I don't, challenges do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can endorse that one either. That sounds, I do remember someone who did that, but I didn't, I couldn't do that. No way. I could not drink 24 beers in, in 24 hours. No way. That's, that's possible for me. Back in the day, back in the day. No, even then, youth. dude. <laughs> Maybe for you, yeah. Um, so I don't know if I'd recommend that one either, but the rest of them, dude, or the four-state challenge, did you say that one? Yeah, yeah, the four-state challenge. Yeah, that's challenge. a big one. That's a big one I know a lot of people do. I, I would kind of wish I had done that one. That seems like a fun challenge. Um, yeah, you should do that one. What's the? What, you said the Connecticut challenge. Yeah, I think it's all 52 miles of Connecticut in one day. Yeah, that, that's, that makes sense. Um, I would die. I think I would just die. Maybe Connecticut's a pretty easy state, so you might be surprised. Um, hmm. it, it'd be a stretch, but it might be more doable than you think. And it, hell, it, it might help you get a get a bit ahead on your goal of 120 days. So, yeah. twenty it would be 24 hours of walking and literally like 24 hours of not doing anything after. Yeah, that's so. true. So it might even <laughs> out, huh? <laughs> yeah, it would probably even out. Yeah, I don't know, dude. We'll see. The presidential challenge. What's that one? I, I, I'm not quite sure about the presidential challenge. Something, I something with the presidential ridge. Maybe it's just hiking the entire presidential ridge in one shot. That's, I'm assuming that's the case. I don't actually know. So if it's not that, and someone's screaming at their computer right now or whatever, I'm sorry. But um, if that's the case, that's very doable. I mean, non through hikers do that. So I don't know. But um, there's lots of fun challenges. I'm excited to see which ones you get into. Those would make good YouTube content too. I'm just saying. <laughs> but um, that's something to keep in mind. But we'll anyways, dude, we'll think about it. We're uh, we're at the end of the episode here, but we're not done yet because, as you know, Michael, because you listen to the show apparently, which I really appreciate. Um, we got to do a story, dude. It's story time at the end of the episode. Now you haven't through hiked yet, but you've got enough backpacking experience that you got to have something good for us. So uh, take it away, my friend. Well, I mean, the story that I'm going to share is going to be, you know, I'm not a through hiker yet. However. Um, in that 90 mile stretch in the last section that I did, I did, um, have a, a problem. I, 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 I was staying at the hostel before I, the hostel around the bend and I ate a frozen pizza <laughs> there the night before I went hiking. And, uh, I don't know if you've ever pulled a pizza out of a freezer that's got a little bit of freezer burn on it. And I probably should have been a little bit wary about maybe how long that was in the freezer. Uh, but I ate that pizza and the next day, I tell you what. Um, I, I was not having a good time on trail and, uh, I, I got out and I was hammock camping at this point in time. I hadn't switched over to tent camping and I was hammock camping and I, and I, I was, I was hammock camping that night and, uh, got out of my hammock to go to the bathroom, like, you know, kind of, kind of normally always do. And, uh, I went to go to the bathroom, find a little trail and, and ducked off to the side to, and, uh, while I was, while I was peeing, uh, something else came out. <laughs> <laughs> so I did wind up pooping myself on the trail and it was a 3 a.m. in the morning. And here I am, um, you know, in a camp full of people, like there's a lot of people staying at that shelter. And so I had to get my headlamp out, find the wipes, go to the privy, clean myself, change underwear. It was, it was, a, it was an absolute mess. So it was, it, like was a, it was not a fun a, experience. That's a that's a rite of passage, and you've you've checked it off before you even through hiked. So you, dude, yeah. you're you're uh you're well on your way, my friend. I genuinely i I think you're gonna do great, man. Um, and I appreciate you coming on here. 
everybody make sure you go subscribe to michael's channel he's hilarious first of all uh his videos are super well put together i suck at hiking that should tell you all you need to know uh in terms of his i don't know i feel like if you liked my style of like being goofy and, and fucking around a lot you'll you'll like his too with a better production value i might add um <laughs> and so or production quality so go subscribe to his channel i'll have a link to it in the description and in the show notes if you're listening on audio and um yeah man thank you so much for uh for for doing this episode and i hope you were able to learn a little bit here uh God, and let me know if you I, have I any appreciate more all the information that that you've provided me but more importantly i appreciate all that you do for the hiking community i mean you you, you really do make a, a big effect you know not just with trail tales but also with what you do on youtube and and you're 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 a fantastic uh example of what the hiking community should be welcoming and uh i appreciate it man oh i appreciate that all i do now is scare people away from hiking so i don't know what you're talking about uh, but you, um, you do i mean i listen to a few <laughs> of the uh the 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 trail tales pod i mean the uh the the youtube channel hiking videos and, yeah yeah and 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 then that really has kind of like made her think twice about some things so <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, Don't you'll be fine. Me. All right. Good. If you want to know where fine. I'm at, then come fight me in the woods. I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah, you could probably kick some ass. Uh, <laughs> thank you, man. And um, thank you so much, everybody. If you made it this far, if you made it all the way to the end of the episode, dude, you've got to subscribe to the channel. Like, come on. It's only fair. That's I make the rules here, and it's only fair. So subscribe to the Trail Tales YouTube. And if you listen to this far in, five-star reviews on Spotify or iTunes or whatever your uh, or Apple Podcasts, whatever your app is. I'm trying to get this show to a thousand five star reviews on both of those platforms. And so leave a five star review, please. I read all of them. I love them. And uh, thank you so much for listening and watching, everybody. I'll see you next week. Woo!